Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for jumping on. We're going to give it a couple more minutes as I see there are a few people logging on. So just stay patient with us and we'll get started in just a few minutes. And we're just going to give it one more minute. All right, let's go ahead and kick this off. So thank you everybody for jumping on today. We are very excited for part three of our KPHR workshop, um, which those of you that have joined our previous workshops know that we typically collaborate with our HR partner, MEA, on that. So just a quick round of introductions. My name is Chrissy Magnata, Director of Client Engagement with Katz Pierce. Um, for those of you that don't know who we are, we are an employee benefits firm um, focused on small, mid-sized uh, businesses. We're based out of Cherry Hill, New Jersey. And um, again, like I had mentioned today, we're working with MEA, Mid-Atlantic Employers Association, who is our HR partner. Um, for those of you that are members or have been following our briefs know that uh, MEA has been a fantastic partner of ours as we kind of navigate through all this new normal and craziness of the world today. So today we really wanted to bring you a topic that we feel is relevant in um, what is happening in HR today. And that's, you know, now that we're going back to school, how are we gonna mitigate that? Some of us are in PA, some of us are in New Jersey, um, some of us have kids that are fully virtual, some are on a hybrid schedule. So uh, really understanding how to navigate through that environment today has been a, a bit of a challenge for HR. So hopefully, um, you know, we can bring some uh, information to you to help you with that. Um, we are partnering with Amy McAndrew. So those of you that have joined us in the past have known that uh, Amy has been also a great partner through MEA. Um, she is one of their employment law attorneys and uh, she's gonna be running our presentation. Before we kick it over to, uh, to Amy, I'm gonna um, introduce Maria Benelli also with MEA to do a quick little intro on who MEA is and, uh, and uh, also introduce a new team member of theirs. So Maria. Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm Maria Benelli from MEA. I'm the Director of Member Services. And um, just a quick introduction for those that don't know who we are and what we do. Um, MEA provides uh, services that help professionals attract, train, align, and motivate their sales force. Um, we are a membership-driven organization, and um, so we are a cost-effective way and flexible way to fill in the gaps um, for any of the needs that you may have regarding, um, you know, your employee solutions. Um, we're here when you need us um, on a uh, as much as possible or um, as, as little as, as you need uh, with a team of experts at your disposal. Um, so the, the word that I always use to describe MEA 
is collaboration. Um, so with a very collaborative environment between MEA team members and our um, and our members. Um, and as I said, it's a it's a uh, cost effective way to um, to provide solutions uh, for our members. So um, that is uh, just a, a a quick uh, snapshot as to who we are. And I did want to introduce a new teammate of ours who is uh, Matt Rossler. We're very lucky uh, to have gained Matt in the last month. Um, he's senior member, uh, our senior member consultant for uh, strategic HR uh, and business initiatives uh, that our members have or need. Um, so he's helping us to, helping our members to understand what their needs are um, and find the solutions within uh, MEA. Um, so he can be uh, help with projects for our members or on a consistent consulting basis. How did I do, Matt? Did I get that right? <laughs> very good, Maria. Yep. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I appreciate that. <laughs> very good. Very good. Okay. So that was just a, a, a brief um, snapshot as to who we are. And um, Amy, I will uh, kick, kick it off to you. Great, thank you, Maria. <clears throat> Amy, I forgot to mention, um, just very quickly, a few housekeeping items. If you do have questions for Amy, please feel free to, to type those into our chat box. I'll be mitigating those questions. Um, if it's something that feels relevant for the time, I'll, I'll jump in, if that's okay with you, Amy. If not, I'll probably hold most of the questions um, until the end, but we are absolutely happy to answer any questions you may have, so feel free to put those into the uh, chat box for us. Yeah, absolutely, either one of those would work, okay. So let's get started. Um, as Chrissy said, this is a this is a, a really timely topic, um, and just to sort of give you um, a little bit about me. So I am, as, a, as the first slide said, I'm director of legal and compliance services at MEA. I've been an employment attorney for 20 plus years, um, but I'm also a parent. Um, I have two kids. I've got an eighth grader who is going to school in person, um, and I've got a freshman in college who is not. So um, this has been my life for the last six months, in addition to everything that I'm doing um, at MEA around uh, pandemic. Um, it, it's affected my personal life too. So I am very immersed in this topic, um, but I realize that not all of you are, right? Um, if you're an employer, but you don't have kids in school, you may not realize all of the things that are facing um, our, our parents who also happen to be employees, right? Um, so these are the different options that are out there for parents. Um, there's in-person learning, and that's not everywhere, that's for sure. Um, a lot of the independent private schools are offering this, a lot of the Catholic schools are, are offering this, and I think a handful of public school districts are offering this. Um, many more uh, schools are offering 100% virtual and distance learning. Um, I know, for example, um, there are several school districts in my area that this is the only option right now um, especially for the older kids. Um, I know uh, school districts have made a priority to try to get the elementary school age kids in school if possible, um, to, because that does help. Um, first of all, it helps working parents, but it also helps the process for the younger kids. I think it's harder for some of the younger kids to spend the entire day on the computer. Um, so there's that option. And then some schools are doing a, a hybrid system. Um, which means basically the kids go to school um, a couple of days a week and they're home a couple of days a week doing distance learning. In a lot of those cases, for example, kids will go Monday, you know, half the school will go Monday, Tuesday, they'll close Wednesday for cleaning and the other half of the school will go Thursday, Friday. There also are some uh, parents who are able to, and this is a, usually, um, this tends to be more of a middle class or upper middle class solution. Um, with pods uh, or with assistance in the home with virtual learning. Okay, so a pod would be, um, I have four neighbors, we all have kids the same age, and we all are trying to um, work, whether it's from home or in the office, and so we have agreed that one day a week I will take the responsibility of getting all the kids in my house um, and getting them set up for virtual learning, and then the next day they'll go to another neighbor's house and the next day and the next day. Now, this obviously requires a lot. It requires coordination on the part of parents. It requires a commitment. It also requires um, teaming up with like-minded families, right? Families who are taking the, um, the pandemic in a, a way that's as serious as everybody else, because you have to agree on some ground rules if you're going to do that, right? So we, we're not spreading the virus. Um, 
And so in addition to pods, there also are people who have brought tutors in and said, you know, I, I have a job where either I have to be in person, so I can't be in the home, or I have a job where I really have to be working all day. I can't be taking random breaks to help my child figure out what Zoom link they need to be on right now. Um, so they have brought in tutors. Um, some, some of them have brought in college kids. You know, there are a lot of college kids home right now. Um, some have even brought in retired teachers um, to, to either manage their kids individually or to manage the pod that we're talking about. And then, of course, there's the homeschooling option. Um, some parents I've seen have just rejected the whole thing. They said, I can't do this. Um, I don't think the virtual learning works for my kid, whether it's because of their learning style or whatever it is. And they said, I'm just going to homeschool. So those are the, the various options that might be facing your employees right now. Okay. So what about legally required leave? That's obviously the first step when you're talking to an employment attorney, especially. So I'm going to skip over FFCRA for a second because that's my next couple of slides. But FFCRA is the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. I often get asked from by um, our member companies, well, what else is there? What else do we are we required to do under the law? But when you think about the various leave obligations out there, local sick leave laws, state sick leave laws, New Jersey has a state sick leave law, FMLA or New Jersey family leave, um, leave obligations under the Americans with Disabilities Act, those all focus generally speaking on illness or maybe in the case of the sick leave laws, preventative care. Those don't focus on childcare issues. So really for the most part, when you're talking about what's available for childcare issues, it really is the Family First Coronavirus Response Act, okay? So this is what, what FFCRA offers. And first of all, keep in mind that FFCRA applies to private employers with less than 500 employees. The idea behind this was that um, larger employers would hopefully step up and mimic FFCRA or maybe offer more than, F, the, more than FFCRA. But the reason that Congress applied this to, look, to smaller employers is because there is a tax credit tied to this. Okay, so you as the employer, you pay your employee under FFCRA um, and then you can apply for a tax credit for that pay. Um, Congress decided the larger companies don't need that. They should be doing this anyway without the tax credit. Okay, so there's two components to FFCRA. First is the emergency paid sick leave. That's 10 days or 80 hours of paid sick leave. And it's when the employee can't work, okay? Um, and that's work in person or telework for one of these six reasons. Um, the employee is subject to quarantine, federal, state, or local. Um, the employee has been advised by a healthcare provider to self-quarantine. The employee is experiencing COVID symptoms and is seeking a diagnosis. So I wake up one day with all the you know, shortness of breath, I've lost my taste and smell, and I've decided I should probably go get tested. That's when that would apply. Maybe the employee is caring for someone else who's subject to quarantine. Um, or, or, and this is the one that's important for our purposes, the employee is caring for a son or daughter whose school or place of care is closed or the child care provider is unavailable due to COVID-19. That last one, kind of a throwaway in there. I think Congress wanted to catch all. No one really knows what it means, so I'm, gonna, I'm not even gonna talk about that. But really for our purposes, this first two weeks could be used for child care reasons. And then there's an additional 10 weeks, okay? Um, and again, this is only for child care reasons. And this is to care for children whose schools or daycares are closed, um, and it applies to employees who are unable to work or telework. So I can't go to, as an employee, I can't go to work physically, um, right? But also I find that I can't effectively telework because my children um, are at home all day and I'm trying to help them. So this may be, for example, um, you've got call center employees who are working from home right now. They're saying, I can't effectively take call center um, calls because I've got to be helping my kids with their, their schooling. So if you have not done this already, if you are a covered employer, that means if you have less than 500 employees, you've got to be posting the Families First Coronavirus Response Act notice. And this is the link where you can find it. I know we are going to send the slides out um, afterwards. We're going to make the slides available. So you, don't, you could take a picture of that right now, but you're going to get the link. Um, if you have not done this already, you want to physically be posting this in your workplace. If most of your employees um, are working remotely, a good idea would be to prepare an email that goes out to all employees and gives them notice of FFCRA and links to the poster, okay? So I do wanna just take a minute out and talk about the fact that this is an issue that really is disproportionately affecting women. And women have made such great strides in the workplace. Um, and 
a lot to go, right? But, um, but a lot of experts um, are saying that this pandemic could wipe out a lot of the gains that women have made for a couple of reasons. One is that because the unemployment has disproportionately affected women, women tend to be in service jobs, um, in retail jobs um, that are, have been widely affected um, by the pandemic, but also because in a lot of families, the responsibility for the schooling is falling to the mothers, okay? Um, and so, for example, International Monetary Fund, quote, the COVID-19 pandemic threatens to roll back gains in women's economic opportunities, widening gender gaps that persist despite 30 years of progress. International Labor Organization um, similarly has warned COVID-19 could wipe out the modest progress made on gender equality at work in recent decades. Um, in a recent USA Today headline, coronavirus pandemic creates America's first female recession amid childcare and employment woes. So really, it, I think this is something to think about because at the same time that we're all dealing with the pandemic, there is a social justice movement going on, right? Um, and when most of us think of the social justice movement, we do think of, of race issues. Um, but when we're thinking about diversity, equality, and inclusion, that of course includes women, right? Um, and so I think as employers, it's something to be thinking about that if I'm going to lose many of my female employees, especially valued female employees, um, what can I do um, as an employer that may be above and beyond what the law requires to try to hold on to these folks? And what I always say to employers is, you know, do you really want to lose a good employee over anything that might be going on right now that we all hope is really temporary, right? Um, the hope is that six months or a year, we're going to be getting past this, we're going to return to some sort of sense of normalcy. Do you really want to lose an employee who you've invested time, energy, and money training, um, who has done a good job for your organization? Are there creative ways to hold on to these folks? Okay, so when we talk about the flexibility that your employees are going to need or the help that your employees are going to need around this childcare issue, around the schooling issue, I think there are three main questions. Okay. First one is, can we offer flexibility at work, right? Flexibility around when and how the work gets done. Then, can we offer flexibility from work? That means leave and time off. Okay. And then, what about helping out with caregiving? Is there a way to um, subsidize care or help our employees get access to caregiving resources? And this, you know, and what I would really welcome all of you to do um, is if you have done something interesting, creative, a little bit different at work, um, and it doesn't have to be, you know, anything that's, that has a financial component tied to it, but if you've done something for your employees that you found your employees have really appreciated or found useful, we'd love to hear that from you. Okay, so when we talk about flexibility at work, what about hours, okay? Um, do you have an employee who does who is helping kids um, with schooling, you know, from the core hours of maybe eight to three? Maybe the, that that person could work early hours, could work, work late hours. And again, if their job is not as time sensitive, right? If it's not taking call center calls, right? Um, there probably is a way that the employee could maybe work from six to eight in the morning and then work from three to whenever in the evening. It makes for a really long day for the employee potentially, um, but it's probably something that you could do um, to work with the employee. And what we're also finding is maybe some parents are sharing the, the, the uh, schooling responsibility. So one parent might take the morning, one parent might take the afternoon, and you could play around with that for your employees as well. What about compressed work weeks? For some employees, four 10-hour days are gonna work better than five eight-hour days. Is that potentially an option? What about job restructuring? Is there a way to maybe take one or two responsibilities away from the employee, you know, non-essential responsibilities and give them to someone else temporarily um, while they get through the schooling situation, while they get through the childcare situation? I mean, I think one of the, the pieces of good news is that back in March, when everything shut down, most childcare centers shut down too, except for the ones that were open for essential workers. Um, at least now, most of the daycare centers are open so that, um, you know, the infants up up through five are mostly in care. It just then becomes an issue that some parents are, are nervous about sending their kids, but that's kind of a different issue. Um, how about a job share or reduced hours? You have two employees who do the same thing, 
both are having child care issues because you maybe reduce their hours so that they're essentially functioning as one person. One of them works Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday mornings. One of them works Wednesday afternoon, Thursday, Friday. Of course, telework. I think a lot of us are teleworking right now. Um, something interesting that I'm hearing fr from a lot of our MEA members right now is they are trying to get people back physically to work, okay? Now, we have some members who've, who've been back, right? Our manufacturing members, our healthcare members, they've been there pretty much the entire time. Um, but some members are now saying, hey, the manufacturing folks, the people on the line have been there the whole time. We wanna get the office workers back. Or some members are saying, hey, we've all been virtual now for six months. Let's slowly start to bring everybody back so that we can see each other. We can have that collaboration that really is hard to do over Zoom, right? That, that works best when we can see each other in person. I mean, I think a lot of the best ideas in a lot of uh, organizations come. I'm walking down the hall, a light bulb goes off. I think, oh, I should talk to my colleagues, Maria or Matt, about that, right? Um, and I can go straight to their their workspace and have a conversation with them, right? So I think a lot of employers are, are trying to think about, um, can we try to get people back to work? And so there is some resistance to allowing certain people, to try to bring certain people back, but allowing certain people to stay at home. But it's really something to think about. Um, is telework something we should be doing or maybe doing a little bit more for the people who have caregiving requirements right now? And then, of course, the, the question, what about jobs that can't be done remotely, right? Um, there are certain jobs you can't, uh, you can't make widgets on a line um, from your house, right? So what about those? And how can we help those folks, the people who do need to be in person every day? Um, and the answer to that may be if you have multiple shifts, um, maybe someone wants to move to a different shift. Um, is there a possibility with staggering a work time? Um, are there different things that you can do? Um, I did have one member um, that I have spoken to a few times during the pandemic. They're a 24-7 operation. Um, and so they've offered people, um, you know, e maybe you can come in, you come in whenever it works for you. And they had people literally coming in at 4 o'clock in the morning um, to do their job, which was not dependent on anybody else doing their job, so that they could get their work done. So something to think about. Uh, one interesting thing um, I wanted to share with you is, I, um, I read an article recently, and I can't remember where it was from, but I did pull from the article some real life examples of companies, most of which you've heard of, who are doing creative things. Now, these are larger companies. They may have different resources than you have, um, but still, it might spark an idea of something that you can do. So for example, Paylocity um, has said that they have each of their employees speak specifically to a manager, right, to set up a schedule that best meets their work-life balance needs, okay, whether that be early hours, late hours, split schedules, um, and that's something any organization can do, right? Um, in any organization, you can have all of your employees set up some time with the manager, um, talk about what their needs are, talk about what's going on in their lives, and talk about a schedule that works both for them and for the organization, so something to think about. The next thing is, what about flexibility from work? So at the very beginning of the pandemic, um, before FFCRA was even uh, passed, um, we heard about companies um, giving additional PTO, adding to their employees' leave banks to try to help them, you know, both with childcare issues and with potential sickness issues. Because I'm sort of, you know, something that's over here um, that, that we haven't talked about is, is you've got employees, you don't want to spread the virus, right? So anytime you have an employee who wakes up in the morning and doesn't feel 100% right, you want them to be able to stay home. So in addition to the childcare issue, you want uh, employees to feel that they can stay home when they're not feeling well so that they're not potentially bringing the virus into your workplace. So think about what your flexibility can be. There's FFCRA, obviously, but that only applies in a few instances. Um, what can you do to add to people's lead banks, to be a little bit more flexible around PTO, to give people maybe, you know, our normal PTO uh, policy says you can only have leave for these particular reasons. Um, maybe you add some reasons to that. Um, and then, of course, there's the idea of unpaid time off. Um, maybe someone just needs a leave of absence right now to deal with things, but they don't want to sever employment, right? Uh, and maybe that's something that might work. And one thing that's, that's important about when we talk about FFCRA, um, and like I said, some companies who um, don't qualify for FFCRA are mirroring FFCRA. Um, 
But something to think about from an FFCRA point of view is FFCRA is only available when the school is closed, okay? So think about that. Um, and that means closed for an in-person option. So if, you're, if you've got an employee whose child's school is 100% virtual, that school is closed for FFCRA purposes. What about the school that's on a hybrid option? On the days that the, the child goes to school in person, FFCRA does not apply. Now, it may be that actor's care is not available for COVID purposes, then FFCRA might apply for the aftercare program. Okay, so this does get complicated. Um, but an even bigger complication is what about employees who just decide, you know, the school is open, there's an in-person option, but I'm nervous. I don't want to send my kids there. Um, in that case, FFCRA does not apply. So it, it can get very complicated and it does require having conversations with your employees. It requires um, communication with your employees so they understand what their rights are um, so that they can make intelligent decisions about what they're doing as well. So again, I told you I read this great article, but unfortunately I can't remember where I read it. Um, but a couple of examples, and again, these are huge companies, I get it. Um, but uh, back at the beginning of the pandemic, Microsoft gave their employees an additional 12 weeks of paid parental leave. Um, and in April, Google extended family leave to 14 weeks uh, for workers to care for families during the pandemic. But that's kind of the idea that Congress had that, you know, we are going to um, make FFCRA applicable to smaller companies with the hope and the belief that the larger companies are going to step up and they're going to do something around this too. So here's an example of two, I understand huge companies who have stepped in and who have said, um, yes, we're going to offer that kind of leave um, to our employees, even though we're not required by law to do so. All right. So I said there, there were three questions you should be asking your, yourself right now. The third one is about caregiving. So you've had, you're talking about flexibility at work, flexibility from work. What can we do to just help our employees with caregiving? We can't be real flexible at work. We have set hours and so we have to get the work done. We can't be as flexible from work. Um, we, don't, we can't give people lead time, right? Um, and that's a point too. There is an exception under FFCRA for smaller employers. Um, if you have less than 50 employees and you have an, uh, a, an employee who comes to you and says, I need time under FFCRA, you can make a decision as the employer that no, I cannot offer you that leave, all right? Now, there's a set of criteria that you need to go through. You don't have to get approval from the Department of Labor. You don't have to get approval from anyone. Um, but you can deny the leave if you believe in good faith that you meet that criteria. It's a little bit of a gamble, right? Because if you say no, the employee could go to the Department of Labor and complain about you. They could file a lawsuit against you. Um, so you want to have that conversation with an employment attorney. Um, make sure you're documenting and you have all, all your ducks in a row as to your reasons that you're going to deny. But there is an option for, for the very small employers who, if that one employee takes 12 weeks off, it's going to really uh, adversely affect my workplace. You could make that decision um, that you're going to deny the leave. But again, talk to an employment attorney before you do that. Okay. So again, it may be that you can't offer the flexibility at work. You can't offer the flexibility from work. Can you help your employees with their childcare? Maybe you can subsidize care. Um, there's certainly, when I worked at a law firm, for example, um, most large law firms have emergency care. So they, um, they contract with a daycare provider um, to provide emergency care. So if, the, if your regular childcare provider is unavailable, um, you know, if you have your, your, the grandparents watching the kids and grandparents get sick, you could bring the child into this childcare center and it's a great rate, it's a subsidized care. Okay, maybe you could do something around that, make a deal with a, a daycare provider. But again, that's expensive, right? But what about access to caregiving resources? Um, you know, there are resources out there. There's care.com, for example. Um, maybe you could get uh, uh, some sort of a, a rate for your employees, or you could subsidize that and pay, pay two months of care.com for your employees so that they can get into the database and try to find care that would help them. Um, or maybe you could create some sort of a parental support network, all right? Maybe there's, you know, uh, a way that you can connect different parents so they could be talking to each other, right, about this is what I'm doing, this is what I'm doing, and this is what might be helpful. Or maybe parents could find each other who live near each other and they could help support each other in some way. So again, a couple of 
really um, interesting examples around this. Um, software developer Globant provides virtual activities for the kids. Okay, so they, you know, so I can't care for your kids, right? But I can do something to help keep them busy during the day while you're trying to work. Um, so a virtual art class, um, virtual movement breaks. So, you know, you've seen like kid yoga out there um, or magic shows. And that allows the kids to be entertained. Maybe they're sitting side by side, um, you know, with a parent who's trying to work. The kids on their Zoom, the parents on their Zoom. Um, and it's run by outside professionals, so it hopefully should be engaging for the kids. But that's one idea. And this, again, I understand that this is something that, that can only be done by a, a Toyota or a similarly sized company. Um, but at one of its manufacturing plants in Kentucky, Toyota created on-site supervision. Okay, they got some professionals, they got space, they got licensed, and they will bring kids in. Um, so kids can come to work with their parents, then kids will go to the school, right? Um, and they will have uh, professionals there to help the kids do their virtual learning for the day. And that includes after school care. So again, that's a sort of an extreme example, but you know, can you sort of build off of these ideas and maybe help your employees to figure something out? Now, um, lawyers always come around to ruin the party, right? Um, there already have been over a thousand pieces of litigation filed in connection with um, employment-related COVID claims, and there will be many more. Um, anyone, I don't know, if, uh, uh, hopefully I know a few of you who are listening today, um, so if you've talked to me or if you've heard me speak before, um, you know that I've said this, the lawsuits are coming, um, and I think we as employers are all trying our best um, to do what we can to help sustain our businesses, to help our employees, um, to hope that, you know, there is a business going forward. Um, but even when we do our best, we're going to step on some landmines from time to time. Um, so we really need to think about the legal pitfalls of accommodating caregiving needs. Um, possible discrimination claims. Am I treating the, the female parents differently than the male parents? I'm assuming that the female parents have the need, the male parents do not. When the male parent comes forward and says, you know, I need uh, 12 weeks off for FFCRA, is my immediate reaction as an employer, well, where's the mother? Why, why can't that person, or well, isn't there someone else, you know, who can take care for the kids? Um, if that's my immediate reaction with the male employees, I might be setting myself up for some sort of a discrimination claim. What are the ADA implications of all of this? Um, something really interesting that is going to come out of the pandemic, or maybe already has. You know, there were so many employers for so long who said, telework doesn't work for us. We can't be working from home. Um, we're just not the kind of company that can do that, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I think what we found out is it works for most of us, right? Uh, most of us have been pretty productive. I've been mostly at home for the last six months, and I've been extremely productive. Um, and I think most of the folks at MEA have been as well. Um, so what are our ADA implications? You know, you need to, under the Americans with Disabilities Act, you need to provide a reasonable accommodation to employees with disabilities. And for a long time, employees have been asking for telework as a reasonable accommodation. And so many employers have said no because they've said that's impossible. But here we are six months into a pandemic and it's pretty possible for most of us. So that's going to be interesting also. Um, and how about if only some people can be accommodated, right? Um, we can't accommodate everybody with their child giving needs, child care needs, um, but we can accommodate half the people who have asked for the accommodation. What do you do then? How do you decide who? Um, again, if you're disproportionately um, favoring one group, one type of protected class, whether it's gender or race or age, um, you know, you need to think about what the potential is for a lawsuit. And of course, the HR mantra, the you know, document, document, document. Um, whatever decisions you're making, uh, let's think about how we can document this in a good and thoughtful way. Um, we want, you know, you want to make sure you're documenting things, but not documenting them in a way that's going to come back to haunt you. So again, this is a great um, conversation to be having with your employment lawyer um, if you are finding yourself sort of in this pickle that, um, you know, I, I, I have all these employees asking for accommodations and I don't know what to do with them. And then the non-legal pitfalls of accommodating caregiving needs. I know this, it's a concern for a lot of employers. You know, are employees really as productive working remotely? Um, I was just having this conversation with my husband last night. His employer, large company, 
is trying to get people back in the office. Um, and I think a lot of times that's because uh, there are certain leaders, right, who don't believe people are being productive unless the leaders can see the people butts and seats actually doing their job. And uh, it's a little bit generational. That's kind of a sensitive topic, but it is a little bit generational here. Um, some of some workers who are more comfortable tech with technology um, aren't going to doubt that, that people at home can be just as productive as people in an office. In some ways, you can be more productive if you're not getting distracted every five minutes. Um, but you do, like I said before, you, lo you lose some of that collaborative um, nature. You lose some of that camaraderie that comes from being in an office. So there is that concern, though. Are employees as productive? And what should we do about that? We can measure productivity. Um, there are, uh, there is software that we can put on our employees' computers. Don't put it on there without telling them in writing and getting them to sign off. You can measure key keystrokes. You can figure out where they're going um, on the internet all day. Um, but should we? You know, what does that do to your to your workforce? What does that say to them? Um, does it say that you don't trust them? Um, you know, is that a good idea? Does that help motivate your employees or is that more likely to get your employees to say, you know what, this isn't a company that I want to work for anymore. So another potential pitfall. So uh, another thing we're hearing about so much um, through the pandemic is employee burnout, right? We have employees who are largely working from home. And what that means is that there are not the parameters that we used to see around work. Right. It used to be that you'd get up in the morning, you would go to an office, you know, some, get there somewhere between eight and nine. You would work all day and you would leave somewhere around five o'clock. Right. And, you, would, you know, maybe you check email in the evening. But for the most part, you've had a defined work day. Now, um, I know for me, I work in my dining room. So get up in the morning, check an email, walk, you know, take my three minute walk into the dining room um, and I'm at work. And now I'm at work all day um, through the evening because work is right there. Um, and if something comes up, I just quickly log back on my computer and I deal with it rather than waiting till the next day. And so we do have issues with employees not feeling engaged, um, feeling burnt out. And another big piece of this is employees not taking PTO. So as an aside, um, you know, a lot of employees did not take PTO because they didn't feel they had anywhere to go. I know I personally have had two vacations canceled this year um, due to coronavirus. Um, and a lot of your employees are in the same boat. So, you know, some of the, some people took, they at least got to the beach um, this summer, but you've got a lot of employees with a lot of time in their PTO banks. Um, so they're not taking the time off to refresh because they, they feel there's nowhere fun to go. There's nothing to do that will help them refresh as they have in past years. So what do we do to kind of help our employees through all of this? The first idea is to survey, if you haven't done this already. Um, what are their experiences? What are their needs? Um, what can we do to help? Next really important thing is, what are your company leaders showing your employees around work-life balance, right? Um, are, your, are your leaders willing to show their own vulnerability? Uh, that they have caregiving needs too. Because if your leaders, if your supervisors, if your managers pretend like they have no caregiving needs at home, or maybe some of them don't, right? They, have, they either don't have kids or they have older kids. Um, it makes the, the workers feel that they can't say anything, right? That they can't um, speak up about their needs because um, my, uh, my supervisor, my manager, um, my company owner has never said anything about that being an issue. You know, it's a completely different thing if you're on a Zoom and somebody's kid runs in, right, um, and asks a question. Um, this actually happened to us yesterday. We were running a webinar, and the person, we had someone from an outside law firm coming in to talk about cybersecurity. And her son, who is virtually learning, came in during her webinar. She was in her kitchen um, to, to ask her a question. And so she just kind of gave him a look, and he walked away. But, you know, if, if, if we all normalize that, right, um, you know, I'm surprised my dogs haven't started barking. Since we've been here. Um, but if we all kind of normalize that we all have lives um, outside of the workspace, um, I think that would make everyone feel more comfortable around this issue. All right. And then what are you doing to help your managers right now? Okay. Um, really think about training for them, uh, how to lead a virtual workforce, 
how do I identify signs that an employee is struggling? You know, a lot of times an employee is not going to tell you that they're struggling. And it would be helpful if the manager would know how to ask the right questions. Um, are your managers having one-on-ones or having small group meetings every week at least to talk to their employees and saying, hey, what's up? What's bothering you? What's going on? How approachable are your managers to have those conversations? And it may be that your managers just don't know how to do it, so training could be really important. And what about your meetings? I think in the beginning of the pandemic, um, there were a lot of great memes going around about um, now we're all going to find out which, uh, which of those meetings could have been emails, right? Um, but the, the meetings have continued for the most part. They're largely on Zoom. Um, but do we really need all the meetings that we're having, right? Um, so maybe you want to set some rules around meetings, right? Um, set times during the day that meetings can happen. And when those would be, um, probably depend on your workforce and your workforce needs. So that's where that survey comes into play. One of the questions in the survey you could ask are what are your best core hours for work? Um, so maybe it's that we only have meetings between, um, between 9 and 11 and between 3 and 5, for example. Um, and we try to fit those in. And then, of course, you minimize your meeting time whenever possible. Um, we've all been in the endless meeting, right? Um, the, the meeting that never needed to be that long. Shorten the meeting time when you can. And be really clear about, is this a, a, a must attend meeting or is this a, 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 you know, a maybe attend meeting, right? Um, are they, is it just a catch up? Is it just a social opportunity? Or is it really business critical? Um, and do I really need to attend? Because what some employees are going to decide is that, um, I don't need to be at every meeting. And I think you as an employer can say that. You probably don't need to be at every meeting. Pick the ones that you attend. So this is a great scene. Um, you guys may have remember. This is pre-pandemic. Um, this gentleman was appearing on BBC. Um, and in the middle of his presentation, his one of his kids <laughs> toddled in. Um, and his wife ran in to try to get the kid. And it went completely viral, um, which is interesting because it sparked up a whole conversation about um, you know, everybody thought how cute it was. Would people have thought it was as cute if you know, it was a woman that it happened to? But in any event, um, again, you know, we need to be understanding that caregiving needs may interrupt meetings. I know there are some companies that do the, you know, the, the baby and the toddler shout outs. Um, actually, my husband was on one yesterday. They did a dog shout out. So everybody brought their dogs in to be seen. But at some some companies, you know, every once in a while they'll say, hey, show you, show how cute your kid is on, on camera. Um, we need to expect that that's going to happen, right? Caregiving needs may interrupt meetings. Sometimes somebody's going to turn their webcam off to go deal with something. Doesn't mean they're not still there. Doesn't mean they're not still listening. Maybe you can record meetings. So, you know, you've told some of your employees, okay, that's a meeting you don't have to go to, but we're going to record it so that you um, can be familiar with the content so you're not behind next time. And of course, parent support groups, whether that's internal or external, what resources can you find for your employees um, to help them su feel supported, um, to help them feel that they have resources out there? And then have a self-care. What, what do you have to offer your employees in that area? Do you have an employee assistance program? If you do, do your employees know? Do they know what, what, what the EAP involves? Do they know that they can reach out to the EAP at any time and it's not going to cost them any money to do that initial reach out. Um, if you haven't done that in a while, remind your employees that you have an EAP. What can you do around encouraging physical activity and mental health? What resources might your, um, your health insurance plan offer, right? Um, is there a free telehealth conversation with a counselor? Um, can you give links to yoga, to meditation, um, to exercise classes. There's a lot of free stuff out there that you might be able to suggest to your employees. I think we were doing really well with this at the beginning of the pandemic, and I think a lot of us have fallen off a little bit. So maybe there are some resources out there, and maybe your EAP can give you some of those resources if you, if you reach out to them. So just really remember that, you know, for the most part, employees are working harder than they have before, harder than they were pre-pandemic, and they're more stressed, right? Um, I was just emailing with a member this morning and they have a positive COVID case. And so I was um, talking them through that a little bit. Uh, but I said, you know, hope you're doing okay. Um, in spite of the positive COVID test, the response that came back, oh yeah, just dealing with all the stress, you know, of back to school and fear of getting sick and anxiety and, you know, all the great things that come along with being an HR person during the pandemic. So we're all feeling it, you know. Um, 
and, and let's try to figure out ways, again, to help our employees stay engaged and to help them be as productive as they can be. Because I know at the end of the day, this is all about running the business. Um, but let's try to keep people engaged and keep them as productive as they can be. All right, so Chrissy, do we have any questions coming through? And if we don't, this would be a great time to ask them. <laughs> yes, please. Uh, please put in any questions that you may have into the chat box. Also, if you have some really innovative or interesting ways that you have been um, kind of mitigating some of this stuff within your own organization, uh, please feel free to share that. Love to share that with the group if you have some interesting insight into that. Um, from a benefits perspective, uh, you know, just want to throw out a little, a little uh, word to the wise or a, a caution uh, to all of our employees or employers here. You know, if you're looking to extend on some of those leave policies, you really want to be aware of benefit eligibility issues that could arise. So, uh, you know, whether that be you're in a self-funded plan or you're in a fully assured plan, you want to make sure that if you're extending eligible or extending a leave policy outside of something that is either in place pre-pandemic or something that is in relation to some of the new regulations that have been brought on from the pandemic, you want to make sure you're amending your SPDs and you're making your carriers aware of those, uh, you know, le new leave policies and extensions. Um, you know, a great example of this is, uh, you know, if you do want to offer a personal, um, you know, policy within the organization saying, okay, we're going to give you an extra two weeks or an extra six weeks or whatever it might be on top of FFCRA or F FMLA um, or even New Jersey FLA, you know, all of these leave laws that we have in place. Um, you want to make sure that the, the carrier is aware of that because that could affect how an employee is eligible to stay on the benefits and whether or not they need to be moved to COBRA, which in turn um, may cause an issue when it comes to paying out claims. So something to be aware of. Of course, if you ever have questions on that, you feel free to reach out to us. We're more than happy to guide you through um, best practice as it relates to that. Um, I do have a question now. As obviously FFCRA um, was put in place, um, you know, quite some time ago. You know, I say quite some time ago. It was really only what five, six months ago, but it feels like it was a lifetime ago. <laughs> Um, for employees that have used up all of their time because they were home with their children, you know, kind of at the end of the school year last year, and now they're heading into a new school year this year, um, you know, I, I know we always want to err on the side of caution when it comes to any type of, uh, you know, employee issue that could potentially bring in litigation, especially in, a, in, a, in an environment that's so kind of uncertain like today. Um, but what would you advise clients to do or members to do if they have employees that have used up all of that time and now they need to take more time and they have, you know, they've kind of run out of that paid time off? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, FFCRA, FFCRA went into effect on April 1st. It's set to expire on December 31st of this year, but it did only provide for 12 weeks. So as, as you say, Chrissy, it, it may very well be that some parents have already run through those 12 weeks. I mean, they, they took the time in the spring thinking, well, of course, schools will be open in the fall. Um, little did we know. Um, so if they've run through their 12 weeks, they are no longer eligible under FFCRA. Interestingly, if they've run through that time under FFCRA, it also counts against FMLA. So um, that's a conversation to have as well. Um, so you have some options around being flexible with your employees at that point, but you don't have a, a, any kind of a, a mandate from the law as to what you need to do. I have had a lot of questions from MEA members. What do I think is going to happen? Do I think that Congress is going to extend FFCRA and give us a, a a new 12 weeks on January 1st. And I, you know, the answer, like any good lawyer answer is it depends, right? Um, I think it's gonna depend on where we are with the virus in a couple of months. Um, if schools remain closed or largely closed or in a hybrid model. Um, and if Congress can get their act together, right? Because keep in mind, we're gonna have a, a lame duck um, until uh, a lame duck president potentially, um, and maybe some lame duck Congress till the end of the year. So it, it it depends. Um, I, I am hopeful that yes, Congress will do that and they can agree on that, but um, we don't know at this point. And they can't, I mean, they couldn't even agree on how to extend the unemployment comp benefits. So it's not clear what's going to happen with FFCRA. Sure. Um, and this is going to be more so for our New Jersey folks here that still have, I, I don't believe that PA currently has this, but New Jersey, we have 
um, you know, state quarantine requirements, right, for travel advisory. So we have a bunch of states that are on our list. If you travel there, when you come back, it's highly recommended that you quarantine for 14 days. Um, so how are you, you know, kind of advising employers to deal with that, especially when you have employees that could potentially be traveling a lot? Right. So we actually do have that in Pennsylvania as well. Um, okay. We've got a list of quarantine states, um, just like New Jersey does. But both states, it's not um, an order. It's a, like you said, it's a suggestion, a strong suggestion, but it's a suggestion nonetheless. And as a result, I have taken the position that I don't think FSCRA applies because that's not a government order to stay home. Um, I could be proven, I keep telling people, I could be proven wrong when this is all over. I hope not, but I could, you know, I could be proven wrong when this is all said and done. Um, but what, I, what I've been advising folks to do is, first of all, think about what's the reason for the travel, right? Is there a business reason for the travel? Is this business travel or is this personal travel? Um, for the business travel, I think you really need to think as an employer, do I really want to send someone into a hot spot? Um, is it really that important that they go? Could this be something that's done over the phone or via Zoom? Because, and I'm going to go off on a tangent here for a second, um, I as an employer have an obligation to provide a safe workplace for my employees. And if I send them into um, a known COVID hotspot to do work for me, I potentially could have an obligation to them if they get sick. Um, so that's the first part. Think real hard about from a business point of view if you really want to be sending people to any of these states. From a personal point of view, um, I saw it a lot this summer. Um, employees were going to Florida and, and South Carolina on vacation. So we were advising members to put in place a written policy around travel. That is, you need to tell us where you're going if you're going to one of these hotspots. Um, you need to be honest with us. There's going to be repercussions if you lie. And then we later see a Facebook post about you being at Disney World, right? Um, and, what, and what we're going to do to help you through a quarantine period when you get back. So either it's going to be that you can do your job from home and so we'll let you, or you're going to be at home not making any money because you can't work. Um, and then hopefully you've instituted that policy before employees make the decisions about traveling so they can decide. Um, am I okay with being at home potentially for two weeks without making any money? Is this vacation worth it? Or you could let them take their PTO, of course, if they have PTO time. But yeah, it's tricky. I think um, as employers, we really want to try to let people, um, you know, we want people to be able to travel and take time off, but the preference is for them not to be going to these hotspot states. So the next question is, is really going to be kind of a, a second piece to that. So say an employee is traveling, right? It is for a vacation or personal time or whatever it might be. And, and they and, and the office is open and you're in the office, but you have employees that are concerned to come into the office with that person that is supposed to be quarantining. I guess, what side of the coin do you kind of err on uh, when it comes to deciding how to mitigate through handling that? Yeah, I mean, I want the person to quarantine. I want that person to know they're not coming to work for two weeks um, and, and without symptoms, right? And, and they, they're only coming back to work if they don't have a fever, they don't, they don't have all the COVID symptoms. So, you know, it's hard. I, I've, the fear of the virus is as much of an issue for employers as the actual virus in many ways, right? Um, you've got employees who don't want to come back to the workplace because they're scared. You've got employees who are looking side eye at other employees because they think that they're engaging in um, risky activity. It's hard. Um, it's really hard to um, to take all of that into account. But I will say this: we, as uh, at MEA, have a lot of members who've been open this whole time. You know, our manufacturing folks in particular, and they're doing all the right things, and they're they're having very minimal exposures. So um, there is a way to do this, you know, wear the masks, do screening, definitely um, ask your screening questions, do temperature checks or ask your employees to report temperature. And I, I think there is a way and clean. And I think there's a way to do this and do it safely. You know, certainly MEA in the last couple of months, we've opened back up for in-person trainings. We've got a lot of members who really want to be in person for training. So we've got everything socially distanced. We've got a mask policy. We've got tons of hand sanitizer. We've got wipes. And we're doing it and we're doing it safely. So there is a way to do it. Um, and part of this too, and this is the part that I tend to forget, um, there is an education piece to this because I am so immersed in COVID and how it spreads and what you should be doing to protect yourself in public and at work um, that I forget that not everybody is. So employers could go a long way with educating their folks as well. Um, and especially because people are getting their information from different news sources, 
you know, some news, news sources are reporting this differently than others. Um, so I think it's really important to try to give a, as much objective information to your employees as possible. Um, one of the things we did at MEA is we downloaded a bunch of the CDC's posters. They have some great posters. Um, and if you haven't, uh, for anybody on the call, if you have not spent any time on the CDC's website, it's actually really good. Um, if you have an extra five minutes this week, next week, um, just go on and kind of poke around their COVID-19 area. Um, I think you'll be surprised at all the great information that, that is there and a lot of the great stuff that you can share with your employees. Great. Um, and uh, Michelle, I do see, or Mitchell, I do see your uh, your question here. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually email this over to Amy afterwards. I think this is just a little specific around union shops and public sectors and sectors and pension plans. Um, so I'm going to send this in a separate email over to Amy so she can address that for you, um, and and I will certainly include you on that. Um, and I guess, you know, as we kind of close out, um, you know, it doesn't seem like I have any questions, uh, any more questions here, um, but I will say in respect to what I'm seeing some employers doing, I do know we have one employer um, that was looking into the care.com, you know, looking into offering, um, you know, some extra help, extra set of hands, things like that, as it relates to, uh, you know, employees dealing with kids learning virtually. Um, they found that, that there's still a pretty significant cost out of the employer employee's pocket. So what they decided to do is something that you, I think, even suggested is they created an intranet, um, you know, kind of a space for all of their employees to go to, to be able to work together to share ideas and also share resources. So, you know, if they are, if they are living in the same area or, or they're local, maybe they're friends outside of work, um, you know, maybe they share resources in regard to bringing in some outside help but having them, uh, you know, bringing in a couple of, of families at one time versus, you know, kind of dealing with that on their own. So I thought that was a great idea. I thought that was a great way to bring in a collaborative approach because um, we are all in this together. And, you know, as we're learning the best way to uh, figure these things out, you know, it, it really is, it's a learning curve for all of us. This is uncharted territory for sure. So um, anytime that we can share resources and share ideas is is always going to be helpful for employers and employees and parents and, and you know everybody that's just trying to learn their way through all of this. Um, so with that Absolutely. being said, I think we're going to wrap up. Amy, as always, fantastic job. Thank you so much. Some really great information. Um, we really appreciate having you uh, present with us today. Um, for those of you on the call, you know, we will be uh, finalizing our series work, our workshop series with part four in a couple of months. Um, if you have any specific ideas or anything that you want to hear, um, you know, please feel free to share that information with us. We're more than happy to take some suggestions as we decide on our next topic. But, um, you know, be on the lookout for for that to come out in, in the next couple of months. Anything to add, Amy? No, nope. thank you so much for having me today. Everybody have a great day. All right, thank you so much. Have a good one. All right, bye-bye.